Some of you have received spiritual gifts and even flown into the spiritual gifts before, but there's just something that you need to be activated in you for you to just really go for it. And um, I just believe that you're going to be activated, you're going to receive boldness, and a new fresh outpouring of the gifts of the Holy Spirit tonight. So I want you to open your heart, I want you to open your mind, I want you to just be ready for whatever the Holy Spirit wants to do in here. And, and Mark's going to teach us, and he's going to help us practice, it's going to be just a good time. All right, so shake your neighbor and make sure they're awake. And if you see anybody, uh, <laughs> start prophesying over them right now. You shall stay awake and be alert and ready to receive everything the Lord speaks tonight. And uh, pretty much 90% of us in here already know Mark Lawson, but in case you didn't know him, this is Mark Lawson, and he's awesome. He's Lawson the awesome. And... Uh, And he's going to come teach us about flowing in the prophetic and whatever else because he is prophetic. So who knows what in the world God's going to speak through him tonight. So just, you ready to receive? All right. Come on, Mark. Thank you. Let's give him a big hand. Woo! Woo! Age is all in your mind. (laughs) I know young people that are really old and I know old people that are really young. And it's, if you stop changing, you'll die. So keep changing, right? So I want to kind of, um, we, we kind of chatted about this when, how many of you were here when we were here with you a few weeks, Sundays ago? Uh, okay. Well, we had a chat about this afterward, but um, I want to talk about the prophetic because uh, it's a gateway to everything else. But first, why don't we do this? Just stand to your feet real quick. Lift your hands up to heaven. We're going to pray a short little prayer. We're going to ask the Lord to wake us up and activate us. And so, Lord, we just ask you in Jesus' name for this awesome church, Encounter Church. We thank you for these hungry millennials here, hungry for God, want more of you, want more of your presence. Say, Lord, I want more of your presence. I want more of your gifts. I want everything that you paid for, that you poured out freely for me to have. So I I right now thank you for it. I, I ask you for more. And I pray for you to expand my capacity to receive and change the the way I think and keep allowing me to continue to change the way I think, to repent and keep on repenting, keep on changing the way I think about what I believe. And so uh, right now in Jesus' name, I receive all you have. And I ask for an outpouring And I ask you to allow me to pour out of myself after this. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Have a seat. Okay, I'm going to talk about the prophetic. Is everybody okay? Really great to be here. Um, I'm not preaching, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I don't know if we'll take a break, um, but but what we're going to do in the next two hours is by the end of that, I want us to do some work. I want us to literally... uh, Do it with each other and then evaluate it. And don't freak out like, I'll be evaluated. I hate tests. This isn't, this is not a test. (laughs) Uh, But what it is, is we're just going to step out. And here's the good news. You'll probably do a lot better than you think you're going to do. In fact, uh, in the words of Don Henley of the Eagles, (laughs) what what the head makes cloudy, the heart makes very clear. And that's just words to a New York minute. But anyway, but, but it's true. It's true because that's in the Bible. The Bible is real clear. Your heart is very clear on things. But our mind gets all muddled like, well, what if this and what if that? And so what I'm going to try to do is teach you how to bypass your mental and logical sinners that hinder you from stepping out. Does that make sense? Because this is a heart thing. It's with the heart man believes leading to salvation. Romans 10, right? So we can't believe in our head. Well, I just think I do. I think I can. Thinking like you can isn't enough. We just have to go, I believe. And then step into it. So uh, go to 1 Corinthians 12, please. Is it okay? So this is like, I'll call it prophetic school. And I know you don't like school, but that's okay. (laughs) I'm sorry. Don't get offended at me about school. But uh, 
Okay. Um, let me see where I want to start here. Um, in the last day, Acts 2, 17, 19, you don't have to go there. But it basically says, in the last days, God's going to pour out his spirit on all flesh. And uh, it says, sons and daughters will prophesy. Young men and women will prophesy. Older men will dream dreams. Uh, I do both. <laughs> if I were you, I'd want all of it. And you can have what you... Anything in this book you can have for free, and you can have more of it. The gifts of the Spirit are not like hair color. Or uh, they're not like, well, I just like opera. Well, I don't know anybody in this room that likes opera. Maybe rap. But, but, but uh, uh, we have tastes. Okay. We also, things of the Spirit we can hunger for. And I, I remember I went for years before I realized that we can have all of the gifts of the Spirit operating. We can have all of them if we want it. So the prophetic ministry, I want to de demystify it because a lot of us have some weird kind of urban legends about it. I'm going to deal with that in a minute. But uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 31 talks about spiritual gifts. But at the very end, it says, earnestly desire the best ones, the best gifts, say the best and then, uh, then the chapter 12 talks about the prophetic. Then chapter 13, uh, chapter 13 talks about love. And it, you, know, you know you've read the love chapter, right? 1 Corinthians 13, love is kind, love is patient, you know, and all this. But it basically, love is the way we administrate or pour out, or it's the way we uh, administrate these gifts. It's the, it's the manner in which they're given out. Does that make sense? So we don't do it in arrogance. We do, it says, follow the way of love, but, and then it immediately, the very first verse of chapter 14, right after it talks about love, it sandwiches two chapters about spiritual gifts, 12 and 14. And the beginning of 14, verse one, it says, follow the way of love. Okay. And Again, eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. Now, why prophecy? Does anybody know? This is a test. No. <laughs> why prophecy? Well, prophecy, um, prophecy is a gift where we hear from God. How many of you pray? Let me see your hands. You pray. How many of you have heard from God when you pray? You'll look down, you'll see a scripture. You'll just be praying. You'll go, I need to call so-and-so. I'm worried about her, right? You hear something, or you think, I've got to break up with this guy. He's a devil. <laughs> or, you know what? I can't be friends with that chick anymore. She's just not good for me. Because she doesn't know Jesus, maybe that's a good way to start. But we hear from God. But hearing from God is you, you cry out to God. That's called prayer. You hear from God for somebody else. That's called intercession, right? But to, to do nothing with it is just go, Lord, I just, I just heard from you for Hunter. Lord, I just pray for him. Whew, I hope he's okay. What I do when I hear from God, I go from I pray, I might get something, and then I might pick up the phone and go, hey, I just was praying and you came up, and, and I'll ask, so what do you want me to say to them? When you say something to them, you're telling them something that the Lord said. That's called prophecy. Yes. Prophecy is basically, it's not just foretelling. It's not just, it doesn't have to be futuristic or spooky. You know, it can be normal, not spooky. So uh, why is it important? I don't, it's for the gifts of the Spirit are for the common good, it says in verse 7. Of 12, uh, in, in chapter 12, he talks about all these gifts. He talks about vocal gifts, tongues, prophecy, interpretation, power gifts, faith, healing, miracles, revelation or insight gifts, word of knowledge, discerning spirits, and wisdom. But he says, crave and want this one uh, and walk in all of them. There's no reason to limit it. But here's what I'll tell you. If you don't, it, don't poo-poo or say, well, I don't need prophecy. 
Don't ever do that because it is like a gateway. It's a gateway. If you can hear from God and share it to somebody, you can do that with a word of knowledge. You can do that with a word of wisdom. You can do that with preaching to people. You can do it uh, with a gift of faith, releasing healing. So it opens up a can of, not worms, but a can of, of uh, whoop to the devil. <laughs> the devil doesn't want you to know this. He wants you to shut down like, well, I'm not a prophet. You know, I just don't believe. I think that's kind of in. So don't limit the Holy One of Israel. Don't shut down God because you were trained somewhere that, well, you know, that guy's really prophetic. You know, like I, I had a guy prophesy over me Thursday night. He's awesome. He has this mass, huge church. Awesome. But he hasn't trained very few people in his church to do what he does. And I thought that's sad. And I... This is more effective to get 30 or 40 people trained in it. It's 40 times. This is called, say, multiplication. When you can get what I've got and then do it your way, you know, and I'm going to explain some things that are going to help you do it in a way that's not arrogant, that's not stupid. How many of you like to get a prophetic word? You like that? Let me see here. You know why you like it? You know why you like it? Who doesn't want to hear what Jesus has to say for him, right? It's going to like, do me, please, please. And then, but when we do, there's also this thing, and it's like, I'm not going to get busted, am I? You know? And am I okay? Am I okay? Go, go ahead. I got a word for you. Really? Here's the good news. New Testament prophecy and this prophetic stuff, it's all good. Say it's all good. Turn to somebody next to you and say, it's all good. God doesn't have one bad thing to think about you. He doesn't, that is it. He doesn't need to correct you prophetically. Okay. And I know some people get in the prophetic and they use it because they got a chip on their shoulder and they're angry at people and they're like, and they kind of look funny like, what's going on, Mark? I'm really getting some stuff for everybody in the room. I just really see a lot of things, a lot of dark darkness. And also, I look like I need to use the restroom. (laughs) You know, so so you have that religious thing on people. So I want to demystify this and also expose religious spirit that likes to get in this. This can be like fun, and and it doesn't have to be heavy. Now, I would say this. We're going to do it. Does everybody know each other pretty well in this room? The downside to that. Here's what I'm going to want to do later. Think about this. Think who you don't know. Just don't make a big deal of it, but start thinking who you don't know their story as much because it's really cool to prophesy to somebody you don't know from Adam and just say, well, I just think this. They go, really? And it's so encouraging for you to hear God really cares about you. Amen? So that's the reason I love the prophetic. Because, and I've trained, you know, actually I've trained more people in doing healing and uh, going out on the street and doing that even more than the prophetic. But I think without this, uh, like the church, I'm going to Kuwait in about 10 days. I went into a church of 800. We trained the whole church to do this. In one trip. Then I came back six months later, trained the whole church to do, because they had that, to do healing and miracles and all that stuff. So uh, say it's a gateway. So we should create, number one, we should all crave and cry out to God to walk in all the gifts. Number two, there's no limit how many gifts you can ask for. Say plural. Because John 3.34 says he gives the spirit without measure. There's no limit. Say no limits. And number three, it's a gateway gift. It's a gateway to other things. Now, Revelation 19.10 says, uh, and you can write it down. This is a good scripture. 19.10. For the testimony or witness of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. How do you know you're getting a word from the Lord? When somebody starts doing that and you witness, you go, how do they know this? Like like this man prophesied over me uh, last May. Didn't know me. I'd never, I shook his hand walking in. He just, hey. Yeah, and there's a group of about 40 pastors, and he walked up to me, and he said, and he literally read my mail, told me everything I'd been doing the last two years and what I was going to do, but he was confirming, mostly confirming what had already happened. Then he added some things that I didn't know that were awesome. 
And it just shocked me. But the reason I knew it was God, it was the testimony of Jesus for me. It was the witness of Jesus. You witness, your spirit bears witness, right? And you know it's God. Um, so uh, God, wa God really wants to pour out his revelation and confirmation. Most prophecy is revelation and confirmation of what's already going on in you, not new things like, I just see, I just see a, uh, you're going to start skidding pigs. Yeah, that's what it is. You know, it, in other words, <laughs> most of these things aren't going to be out of left field. They're going to be things that maybe are secrets in your heart and you don't want to talk about necessarily, but only God knows, but God will pull them out. That's why it says that all the, that, that men's hearts are, are, uh, uh, laid bare. It's not some kind of secret sin. It's the, the desires of your heart, the dreams God's given you. That's one of the greatest things for the prophetic. It opens you up to other things. Now let, let's look at first Corinthians 14, three and keep going. Uh, verse 3, it says, what is prophecy? He who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. So there's three reasons for it. And the operative word here is speaks to men or women, but speaks to humans. <laughs> Joking with some ladies earlier, we're human. All right? But but we, you speak to men. It's not intercession. We just hear from God, just go, well, that's cool. God showed me this. God showed me that. Most of what God shows us is for us personally. But when we learn to hear regularly for us personally, we can give other stuff to others. Does that make sense? And you should value this, want this. It's an awesome way to, uh, for evangelism. It's much easier to win somebody in a power encounter than just talking their ear off, right? And arguing with them. And I, you know, I believe in apologetics, but... I apologize for apologetics. If you have to talk to somebody for eight hours to win them to the Lord, you know, that's not my deal. You know, I, I'd rather just let them have a power encounter where they go, oh, that's amazing. And then and then you say, you know what? The Lord's trying to get to your heart. Uh, and they go, please pray for me. And then they, you have an opportunity. So it says, he who prophesies speaks to men for three things, strengthening or encourage, you know, building you up building you up, uh, encouragement, which is strengthening your courage, uh, giving you boldness. And when you hear something from God, it gives you confidence, right? The Bible says the fear of the Lord is strong confidence. The fear of the Lord is brought through the prophetic. I think, that's why I think it's mandatory for every church to operate in the prophetic because it brings a fear of God where they know God's in the house, baby. You know, don't you want to know that? And comfort. Another aspect a lot of people don't understand, when you're discouraged, and your generation is discouraged, you know, uh, you could be. And a lot of people are fighting discouragement. A lot of people in the Atlanta region, you know, the Atlanta region is one of the highest in the country for mental or emotional disorders, and people taking all kind of, uh, uh, you know, Xanax and, you know, antidepressants and all that. It's because we need to be comforted about things, and the Holy Spirit does the comforting, but he uses the prophetic to comfort people. Anyway, so prophecy is awesome uh, for comforting. It's the highest form of intercession. Just some of this you know. Let's talk, uh, let's do some spiritual, uh, spiritual urban legends about prophecy. You know what an urban legend is? Just a myth, it's like, well, I've always heard that this isn't that true? I mean, there was a UFO that landed in Roswell, right? Okay. I don't know. I do know there's a big base there. <laughs> but, uh, but there are spiritual urban legends that pass around church, and people go from church to church, and they never go to the Bible and get it corrected. So here's one. Um, and many are tied to religious and pious phrases, but the prime tactic of the devil is to talk us out of things Jesus has already given us. You can write that down. That's a good one. The primary tactic of the devil is to tell you you don't have or talk you out of what God's already given you, freely given you. 
So the first one, you've heard this before, and I, I mentioned this last time I'm here. Seek the giver, not the gifts. I don't know who first said that. God bless them. And I think maybe in, the, in, in a certain, if people are just clamoring for gifts, sometimes they could be corrected, like, calm down, seek the giver, not the gifts. Fine. Okay. But the point is, uh, we need to seek the gifts and the giver because the giver has the gifts. So we need to seek both. So uh, this implies we don't need the gifts. We need the something else, maybe the fruit. It implies, uh, you know, don't, don't ask about that. If he wants to give them to you, he'll drop them on your lap while you're sleeping. You know, God is not like the tooth fairy. You know, he's not, and there is no tooth fairy, but I'm sorry. Any kids here? No. Uh, they're like, oh, I thought there was, Mark. Okay. But God isn't like Santa Claus. Well, actually, he is. He gives out a lot of gifts. But, and I don't know if he's a jolly fat man. But anyway, uh, but, but we need the gifts and the fruit, and there's no limit in any of it. And why would we say no to any of it, right? And we can't get it naturally. We have to ask. You have not everything that you don't have. It's because you haven't asked for it yet. God does not, this is going to mess you up, but this is true. God does not honor tears over faith. You can go, I, I go through a hard time. It's like, right, ask God to help you. Uh, he, he knows, yes, but he wants you to activate your faith and ask him to help you. Now, is that like he's a, a petty little tester? Like, no, well, let's just see if you ask. I'm not going to help you. Of course he'll help. And if you look in the scripture, you see Jesus weeping uh, because they, were, they didn't have, there weren't enough leaders, actually. So there's a harvest, no leaders. God bless this church for developing leaders. Leaders are the net that hold the harvest, that hold the fish. Leaders are like that net. So the more leaders you have, the bigger the net. The bigger the net, people don't go through the cracks. Uh, but, but we need both. We need both. So don't let anybody talk you out of it. Uh, God honors faith. God responds to faith. Uh, we get tested on our faith. Jesus rebuked the apostles, the disciples. Always the one thing he re rebuked them about was not, well, you shouldn't watch that TV program. No, he, it was like you unbelieving. How, how could you, how can I be with you so long and you still don't believe? Right? Right? He said, we're going the other side. I'm tired. I'm taking a nap. I'm going down here. I'm going into this lower section of the boat for a few minutes. You know, and these weren't big boats. You know, and he goes in this little uh, place where you go to sleep while you're waiting for your whatever. And he goes down in there, and this storm comes up, and they freak out. We're going to die. And he goes, I told you we're going the other side. I mean, what? Does my word mean nothing? You should have You should have taken care of that storm. You've seen me taking care of it. Okay, so a lot of this is we put on God our responsibility. Does that make sense? And so we're like, like healing. I tell people when I train them for healing, if you don't do it, we don't know what, we, we do know this. If we don't pray for somebody that's sick, there's a 100% chance nothing's going to happen with them if we do nothing. 100%. If we do something, there's a one you know, one to 100% chance something might happen. But if we do nothing, guaranteed, nothing's going to happen that moment. So if you don't step into it, this thing of, we, it's like we abdicate responsibility and go, it's God, it's all you. Yes, Lord, praise you. You know, and he's like, I gave you all this? Come on. So, so what I want you to see is we are responsible to do this. And he loves us stepping out and even making mistakes. God doesn't care. He's not going to be like, oh, Mark blew it. He, he misstated something. It's the end of the world. So don't worry about, uh, well, I'm going to address that in a minute about making mistakes. But anyway, we can have whatever we ask for. You have not because you ask not. Amen? Number two, tongues and prophecies will cease. Well, this is a Baptist argument. Sorry. It's these cessationist churches that are taught at Dallas Theological and some others that, you know, 
Tongues will, they pull one scripture out. Tongues and prophecies will cease. Can I just say this? In heaven, there are no need for tongues and prophecies. Absolutely true. But I'm not in heaven right now. Are you? Even the Baptists aren't in heaven till they're dead. So it's true. In heaven, we don't need tongues. So why would he give us tongues and prophecies for heaven? But we do need it on earth. They invalidate their argument. It's like, they will see so someday. So why even worry about it? It's like, right. And we'll, our bodies will cease. Why don't we just shoot ourselves right now and get rid of the body? You know, I mean, if this is all true, we should have two ministries, evangelist and, and assassin. Like, I'm saved, shoot me. <laughs> that's all I'm going to live for. You know, I'm saved and that's my life, right? We, there are people that might die, not get healed. There are, you have no idea of the, it could be thousands of people, you're going to change their life. It could be, you could change one person's life in a three-year period. Just one person that changes a thousand people's lives. My cousin today still lives a homosexual lifestyle in L.A. But he, for six months, he got radically saved and came to my house and witnessed to me. Without my cousin coming to my house, I would not be saved. He came to my house. I didn't go to church. I'm just sitting there. Actually, I invited him to come over to get stoned. And he was like, no thanks. And then by the end of the night, we prayed. We got blasted with the Holy Ghost. We got saved. I've affected many thousand people, many tens of thousands of people. And Linda and I, in our life, and the people we've, uh, and if we pour ourselves into leaders, each leader, uh, you just have no ideas. If you just affected a few leaders a year, by the end of your life, you, it would be exponential. We have no idea. So anyway, is that, is that okay? So that's a stupid cessationist argument. I don't even want to talk about it. It's so stupid. Um, <laughs> of course, we minister in love. This love thing, like, well, I just think if we do it, we got to do it in love. You know, it's like, fine, fine, we'll do it in love. But let's do it. Okay, the third, and this is the third uh, urban legend. Love is the more excellent way. If I just have love, I don't even need gifts. Wrong. Love is the way you do it. Love is the way you live. Uh, love, here's the thing. Why would it say love never fails, right? Love never fails. Isn't that awesome? So if you minister in love, you're not going to fail. Even if somebody doesn't get healed, you didn't fail because they're like, I can't believe that they would love me enough to come out and share that with me. I've never met anybody that I prayed for, prophesied, that said, you know what? I'm offended that you did that. I hate you. How dare you get in my business? Now, you have some devils that don't like you preaching, right? But seriously, 90% of people, maybe 95, will go, that was so kind. Right? Because you got out of your selfish comfort zone. And got in their zone and just said, you know what? I just see that there's something going on with you. You know what? I'm looking at you and I think, does the word Maggie mean anything? You know, and all of a sudden the person, ah! and then you say, well, I see you're uh, this person. You had this run in with them and blah, blah. You know, and the next thing you know, you're getting words of knowledge, but you won't do it unless you at least learn how to hear and then speak. Yeah, this is why prophecy is so important. It's the gateway to all that other stuff. If we'll go up to somewhere and we go, look around, okay, we're doing outreach. We go, well, we don't see any words of knowledge or anything real clear. We see no crutches. Nobody's walking around crippled. We don't see any kind of depression on, you know, just outwardly, we're not picking up. So let's just go start with prophecy. You can always prophesy and go up and say, and I'll go up to people seeing nothing and just say, I've got a word for you. You know that when I say, I've got a word for you, Guess what happens? I got a word for him. Because I stepped out in faith. Does that, are y'all okay? This is so easy. Mon brain dead monkeys can do this. So we, you know what? If brain dead monkeys can do it, we have hope. Here's another one. Look at the people God used. One time he used a donkey. They were saying, come on. And he goes, or whatever donkeys do. And like, nobody. Imagine a, 
Imagine if you were resisting God and your cat turned to you and go, you know what, buddy? I don't think you should do that. Now think about that. With that for your dog, you know, we see that in like, I remember in one of those movies, a dog turned and started talking. They're like, okay, God can do that. Okay, but this is, this is monkey friendly, okay? So um, all religious activity or ministry really is to be done faith working through love, Galatians 5, 6. So that's the way we do it, but we don't do it instead of, oh, I just have love. I just love. I just love. If you love, love is giving. God so loved the world, he gave a care about the person next to him. Indifference to other people is a sign of no love, of selfishness. I'm not saying you're selfish or I'm selfish, but I will say I have to always have to deal with my self, selfishness or preoccupation with my agenda. I have to kill it sometimes and go, oh, what's going on here? Well, I'm in a hurry. I got to get over there. I'm late. Yeah, we'll take five minutes and talk to this person. Okay. So, um, real love, love gives, right? So, uh, 2 Corinthians 1.20 says this, For all the promises of God are yes and amen to the glory of God. Uh, now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who has sealed us and given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So, basically, we have the Spirit, and we don't need to worry if we'll uh, step out in faith and do it in love. So it's faith working through love. Amen? Number four, here's another urban legend. But what if I prophesy wrong and I miss it? It will mess those people up forever and make the Lord look bad. Plus, I don't want to be a false prophet. You ever thought that? I've had people say that. Well, I've had pastors say that to people I've trained. They're like, well, I went back to my church and they said if I made a mistake, I'm a false prophet. I was like, I will prove that's wrong. <laughs> false prophets are not those who give a false or inaccurate prophecy, but those who lead you away from the Lord. Deuteronomy, and I'm not going to read it all, but Deuteronomy 13. The false prophet that was put to death in Deuteronomy 13 tempts people to be led away from the Lord to serve other gods. But in the New Testament, New Testament prophets do three things. I already told them to you. They encourage, right? They they. What do they do? What are the three things that prophecy? Do you remember I just said it? Say it, say it again. Woo! So one of them, or this way, build up, stir up, pull up. Are you all okay? Agabus gave a prophecy in Acts 11 about a famine that would cover the land. He was exactly right. It happened. You know, sometimes you can give a prophecy and it's, it has many details and you'll miss one detail. That doesn't mean you missed it. It means you missed the one detail. I had a guy prophesy and he pointed to the Lord. He said, I see redheaded baby and da, da, da. And he said, I think it's a boy. Da, 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 da. He shouldn't have said that. He should have said, you know what? I hope it's a boy. I don't know. I don't know the sex. And the per they weren't expecting, and literally she was pregnant, and the baby looked exact. I mean, every detail was exactly what he said. But he threw in, I think it's a boy. Like, I'm so awesome. Okay, he missed it. It was a girl. But he was 100% right. But sometimes the problem is not what we get is like we feel anxiety, so we add something to it and start tap dancing and, you know. Da, 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 da. We're not performing. So this is not performance. <laughs> yeah, we're not on stage. So if you make a mistake, that's okay. Are y'all are y'all good? Uh, every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with no variation or uh, shifting shadow. All that means is that God is good. Um, St. Augustine used to, you know, I don't believe everything St. Augustine uh, believed because a lot of that's been proved it's not true. Uh, God's will is not always done in the earth exhaustively. It's obviously not done, right? It's not done because we're not doing it. 
It's really not that complicated. If everybody that knew God was doing his will perfectly, which we're not, but if we were, a lot of good things would be happening that aren't happening. Does that make sense? So, um, so anyway, you're not a false prophet if you make a mistake. Number five, if you ask for spiritual gifts, you might get something bad. No, Luke 11, 5 says this. Uh, it says, if you ask for, Luke, Luke 5 through 13, it says, if you ask for, a, you ask your dad for a fish or an egg or whatever, are you going to get a scorpion? Are you going to get something bad? No. Uh, in fact, somebody stand up and read that. Luke 11, 5. Who has it? Who, you just got a, a good Bible right in front of you, Luke 11, 5. Stand up. First one to find it, stand up and read. And read it. Yeah, go ahead. No, it's Luke 11, 5. Go ahead. Keep going. Oh, that's the ask and you receive. Okay, go ahead. Give the Holy Spirit to those who ask. So any spiritual gift, if we ask, he'll give the Holy Spirit. Are, are you? He, th he didn't throw that. In. It's kind of like, well, what about the fish? I want a, I want an egg. You know, no, he said, I'll give you ask in faith. You're going to get the Holy Spirit will respond. Isn't that good news? And and the, the principle of every spiritual thing is always the same. Ask, seek, knock. Ask, seek, knock. You want something from God? Ask. You want something from God? You ask. It didn't happen. Seek till you get it, and keep knocking, because sooner or later he'll you'll get the bread or you'll get the answer. But um, you know, a lot of this stuff, we want microwave answers. We want like, Lord, I need this. Who's my husband? I've asked. Okay, I've asked three times. It's been 14 minutes. Where is he? Manifest him. Manifest. And I hate to say it, it doesn't quite work like that. And I hate to, I know you will not like, you're looking at me, well, he's old, he's, he's been through a lot of stuff. Of course, he's going to talk about time. But the truth is, a lot of prophecies, sometimes God will give you a prophetic word or reveal something. It won't happen for years. I'm not saying this to diss you. I'm saying if you get like, oh, I just got a word. I just had a vision and a dream about a house. Like, I don't, in 1994, how long ago was that? Like, a billion years? No. Like, 20, what is it, 20-something 20 years ago? Yeah, 21 years, 22 years ago. 94, I get a vision. Three dreams in five months of a house. The same house in the natural. But at that time, I didn't know everything that I saw in the natural, I allegorized and spiritualized. So I was like, well, it was a house that had hardwood floors. So the Lord is, that was made from lumber, which is the, the tree of the Lord planted in the house of God. You know, I was trying to allegorize uh, a natural picture. The Lord took me, showed me a house. Then a month later, he shook, took the same house from another angle. Then four months later, the same house from a third angle. And all I knew is it's the same house. Three different angles. Wow, why? Then I was like, if God speaks to you three times about something, it's certain. Here, here's another thing. If God speaks to you once, that's serious. If he speaks to you twice, better pay attention. Like if he says, break up with him or, or whatever. But I'm sorry, a lot of you ladies are looking at me like you're going to get mad. But... Uh, but if God says something twice, pay serious attention. That's the number of witness. That means, whoa. And here's the danger of the prophetic. Like, I want a word. I want a word. What if we're responsible? 
for every word we get. So I got three dreams, which are like words. They're, prof they're revelation in 1994. You know that from 94, I started, we started looking. Let's go look for that house. It's a natural house. I'm looking. I looked for five years on days off. Never found it. Gave up. 2004, 10 years after I had those dreams, around the same time of year, the fall, summer, late summer and fall. I'm looking to renovate my house. My son-in-law goes, Dad, it's going to cost you $50,000 to redo this, that, and the other. This. Why don't you just sell it and get a brand new house? I go, well, I've been looking at this one. It kind of intrigues me. Where is it? So we go look online. I go, but I, every time I go to it, I can't, the map takes me to the wrong place. He goes, well, look at it now. So we go in there. It's like 10 o'clock at night. He's over at our house. I type, look. I go, the map changed. Or did it? He didn't want anybody to see it. Nobody could find it. But now I wanted to see it. They never got one offer. I was the only one that gave him an offer for this house. Custom house. Sitting there. I pull up to it. And the Lord goes, recognize this? Scared me. 2010 years. I walk up to it. Did I know I was supposed to buy it? I walk up to it. I can't get in there. I just look and I go, this is it. Called the real estate guy from the house. I said, I know it's late. Ira, can you meet me, meet me blah, 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 at 9 a.m.? Yes. I'm there at 9 a.m. walking. I go, that's it. I want to put an offer on it. He goes, well, yours isn't sold yet. I said, yeah, it will. It's sold. <laughs> Everything was done in a matter of days. My house just sold like that. How, how did I know that was the house? I had faith. A lot of people go, well, I just had some dreams. I don't know, it was pizza, whatever. But I paid attention. Pay attention. Okay. Are you all okay? If you ask for spiritual gifts, you're not going to get anything bad. It's going to be awesome. Say it's going to be awesome. God doesn't work in bad, mysterious ways. He works in good, mysterious ways. You know, a lot of people are like, well, some horrible tragedy happened and People try to say it's God's fault. It isn't. Okay. Uh, number six, prophets are special people. Not everyone can prophesy. And you certainly can't teach everyone to prophesy. Wrong. You're an idiot. <laughs> anyway, this is a false, inaccurate view of the equipping gifts. Prophets equip. And I'll tell you this. I know I'm, pro I, I can say, people have called, many people have called me a prophet, but I'll just say this. I'm not a prophet, even if I can prophesy, if I can't equip. If I can't reproduce it in you and a bunch of other people, I'm not a prophet. You're not a pastor if you can't reproduce it in other people. Most pastors understand they have to reproduce themselves to get pastoral care to people. But so do evangelists. So do apostles. What are apostles? Apostles are people that send people into the harvest. They, they activate churches to go into the highways and byways and win the loss. So, um, yeah, if you're a prophet, you can train anyone to do it. And uh, you could be sitting here tonight intrigued by this and go, boy, I want to do that. Desire in you, passion in you means you probably are called to do it. But here's the other thing. Even if you don't feel called to do it, you can still do it. I can do the, I had a prophetic word the other day. You're going to do the work of evangelism with this, with millennial. He gave me a word. This is just, this is uh, a week ago. This guy that is very accurate prophetically comes up to me and says, you know, at this leadership meeting, he goes, uh, God's called you to go to this generation and help them. And I thought, um, and you're that generation. There's others, you know, at different places in Australia. A lot of the churches are filled with millennials. And I thought, if I can give hope to that group, that just jacked me up. It says, you're going to do the work of evangelism with them. There's, you're just going to help them. But the point is, it doesn't say I'm an evangelist, but I'm just going to do whatever is in front of me, whatever he calls me to do. Hello? So what are your qualifications to be able to prophesy? You can all prophesy. I just read it, 1 Corinthians 14.1. You have to be born again. That helps. Is everybody born again? <laughs> Number two, it's a lot easier. But I know people that don't speak in tongues. 
that can prophesy because you have to hear from God. Now, you can't operate in all the gifts if you're not walking in at least. And tongues is a gateway gift to loose your ability to speak. You can't go shapa taka sapa. It's going to be harder for you to say some really hard things that like, I just, I'm just really sensing God wants to heal you now. You know, it's going to be hard to say that if you can't open your mouth and go pasha la manada. You know, you know what I mean? So God knows what he's doing. So the prophetic, you need to learn how to hear and go and tongues you need because it's a gateway to every vocal gift, which is. There's three of them, but, uh, you know, it's for preaching. It's for actually talking. <laughs> and then you have to ask, seek, and knock. Anything you get from God, whether it's the baptism, the Holy Spirit, anything from God. God, I want to do this. Ask, seek, knock. I don't ask to prophesy anymore. I already do it. Once you start doing it, you don't need to ask for it. The things you have faith for, once you get them, you've already got them. Is that? Okay. Um, now. Many of us don't recognize the voice of God when he speaks to us. We hear, but we don't quite understand that, that he's speaking. There's three stages to how God speaks. And can we talk about that for a minute? Can we just zoom on? We're 750. Okay. You wanna, do we want to take a break or what are we going to do? Can we just keep going? Because we're going to be all wrapped up by nine. So, okay. Is everybody listening? Put up your phones. Okay. No. <laughs> Uh, it takes faith to move in the prophetic. So you're going to have to step out of a comfort zone. You can't go, well, I've got it all figured out. And what does the book say? What is that? You know, this isn't like that. What the heart makes very clear, the mind makes very muddled. So don't get all bogged down with thinking, overthinking how to do this. Some of you will do this like falling off a log and you'll be so good at it, you'll be shocked. Others of you will have to uh, work at how you step out. Uh, but I will say that everything from God, if you overthink it, you can miss it. Because you can, you can overshoot. You can try so hard. So what, what are three stages to a prophetic word? Number one, revelation. That's basically the insight, revelation, whatever the Lord gives to you. You can get revelation in a dream. Uh, one night, my wife, on a Saturday night, had a dream. Seven people were in the dream. She wrote down the names, seven names, and there was something different with each one. She woke up, wrote down seven names, and seven things with seven people. Have our service, blah, 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 take the offering, and I'm getting ready to preach. I go, okay, before we go, honey, come up and share this. Seven people stood up. Every one of them were unsaved. Every one of them were visiting. We didn't know any of them in the natural. But the Lord in a dream gave her seven names and seven problems. Uh, and can I say this? The prophetic is awesome because people have problems and you're the answer. I, if you can get leaders, God takes people that will lead and step out into anything to fix problems. If the problems are big enough, he'll raise up somebody really gifted and big. Because like Moses, it's going to be a big problem. 400 years in bondage. And he goes to Moses and he goes, no thanks, I can't talk well. And he goes, you're lucky I don't kill you, but I, that's okay. You really think I can't move your lips, okay? Well... And so God's biggest problem is with us second-guessing ourselves. I can't do that. Never say you can't because the Bible says you can. He says you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Say all things. So that means prophecy. That means healing the sick. You can do all things. There, nothing will be impossible for you. That's what the Bible says. Another scripture, what did God say to Joshua? No man will stand against you all the days of your life. You don't need to be afraid. So, revelation is what we receive. It could be like that, like Linda had. And by the way, all those people got saved. They all got healed. It was an awesome day. I don't remember what happened. I was going to preach on. It didn't matter. It was crazy. <laughs> and everybody was like, <laughs> and, and you're like, does that happen to her every day? Nope. But when it does happen, you better act on it. 
Uh, so it was what we received from God. Then interpretation. The interpretation was we could have gone, well, I had a dream of these seven people. Hmm. I don't know what to do with it. So I think we'll shelve it. Most, there's no power when you shelve it. You have to use it. So Linda had seven names, seven issues, healings or whatever, problem with this, this, and that, and the other. And we administrated it. We, you how you administer, how you figure out what to do with it. Say what to do. What to do, what to do. What do you do with it is, is a big part of it. That's called interpreting. What does this mean? This must be for somebody. So I just took a gamble. Is this right? Now, if, if she would have said those names, none of those people responded. I would have gone. But it took faith to go, let's see. Most of God's stuff is let's see. Do you have it all known? Well, I just know God wants to do it. I've seen people do that. I just know. And they were wrong. Because they just knew. Emotions aren't faith. Faith, sometimes you feel nothing. You're like, I hope this works. <laughs> right? Anyway, so that's interpretation is that which we understand God to be speaking. In other words, what is he trying to say? He, why would he say seven names, seven problems, if he doesn't want us to do something about it? That's kind of common and logical, but a lot of people miss that. They're like, I guess it's for a book I'll write someday or something stupid. You know, I don't know. It could be for a book you write, but how about me? I ran around for years looking for houses. And I never, I mean, I, I wish I had the money back from the gas and the time. Just the driving around like, it must be here. I was like trying to chase. I guess it's like somebody got a glimpse of Bigfoot. And they were like, I'll find him someday. <laughs> you know, but this was a real dream of a real place. <laughs> and number three, it's, so it's re revelation, what we receive, interpretation, what we understand it to mean and three, what are we going to do with it? The application for me is with that, that word about this, the dream about the seven people was let's see if we can find them and pray for them. What we tell people they should do based on the information we receive. Now, this is dangerous because if you walk up to a couple that aren't married, say, we just, I just really feel like you're really good together. It's like, this is my brother? You know. I want to kill him? No. <laughs> or whatever. But, you know, you get to really be wise, but, but you also can't be timid. So, you, so the application is, uh, and we'll, we'll get into that in a minute, because some of the weirdest stuff, uh, different things are very subjective to you. So when you hear something from God, it's subjective to you. So let's talk about how God speaks. And I would always say this, when we share to people what God's saying, let's just as a rule not say, yay, shadabaraha, thus saith God. You could say that, and the Lord is saying, but you don't need to say it, because if God says it, they'll go, oh, I think that's God. Then they'll go, yeah, thanks. You know, but you don't have to say it's God, right, for it to be God. You could say, I feel like God's showing me something. And when you say it, they're like, get it? But we don't have to throw in a religious caveat. Yay, verily, <laughs> thus saith God. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the only one that actually said thus saith the Lord was in the New Testament was wrong. But anyway. <laughs> um, so what is it for? Number one, it's for evangelism. Uh, John 4, the woman at the well. I don't have time to get into that, but you know what that was. But he basically went up and just read her mail and told her all kind of stuff. Um, uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 22 says this. Therefore, th tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but unbelievers. So the idea of, I know some pastors are like, well, we don't want to talk in tongues in our church. It will confuse people. Well, the Bible says tongues are a sign not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. So you're shutting down a sign 
Now, I don't think it should be ridiculous where somebody walks in, you go, Shabaraka say te te te. Mutabara, nada I don't think we have to do that. That's kind of dumb, right? We need to be human and normal and not alien and weird. You know, we can be normal. But nothing's wrong with praying and say, if you want to pray in the spirit, and they'll go, what was that? And a lot of people are more worried about offending people that God says to give a sign to than the sign itself. The sign is a sign. He said it. I didn't. But it says, but prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. Now, I would add something to that. There is more. There are more believing unbelievers. There are people that are classified as ways well, an unbeliever. They believe. They're just, they believe in Bigfoot, or they believe in whatever they believe in. But they believe in, you wouldn't believe the weird things people out there believe. And so the idea, they don't believe, they don't believe in this yet, but they're spiritual, and they want to believe. It's like the, 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 the show, The X-Files, that they're rebirthing, they, I want to believe, now that's about something else. But but the truth is, they want to believe, and there's a hunger for the supernatural. Just look at the movies. All the movies are superheroes and supernatural, right? So the, people want to believe in something bigger. It says, prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. If the whole church comes together in one place, and everybody's speaking in tongues, and there comes in those that don't understand, it doesn't make sense. Right. And you can use that. So we don't all, let's just have a tongues party and freak out our visitors. Yeah. But if you explain, we're going to pray now. And uh, if you want to pray in tongues, and for those guests, we're just praying. We're praying what they call in, in the spirit. You can explain it. But I don't think we should shy away. I think, I think the church has shied away from God. And we should not ever shy away from God. We should put God on display. But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he's convinced by all. So it basically says, if everybody in the church prophesies, that'd be awesome. I didn't say it. If all prophesy, say all. all. How many is that? Everybody. He is convicted by all. So it's for evangelism. Okay. Number two reason for the prophetic and I think this is the most, one of the most important, life calling. Life calling, discovery and accountability. People can be outside of uh, the woman at the well. I mean, the woman at the well shows all of the reasons for the prophetic. But basically, she was on her fifth guy or whatever. I don't know, her lover or whatever. And uh, she was living an immoral lifestyle. He called her out of it without... He said, well, yeah, that's your fifth. That's not your husband anyway, but that's your fifth one. But he didn't go, oh, you're really bad. <laughs> but he did expose it. And she knew. Most sinners, people that are violating their conscience, know it. So you can allude to it without making them feel bad. But it convicts them. That's what it says. You prophesy, they're convicted. I think it's the most convicting thing. A lot of people say, well, I think that's left to the pastor to prophetically preach. When you prophesy over somebody, I've seen people just melt. Just out in, just in the mall or out in, you know, out on the campus, you know, in the store. They're just, and they just, it's like, are you okay? Like I went to a coffee thing the other day. So a lady doesn't know, you know. Not walking with God, friend of brings her, and she said, "I just think this man has something to tell you." He starts telling me stuff. I start call. I start telling her who she is, and this lady had done the same thing, but I did it from a different angle. She already, she's known this lady for years, so I'm a different. She's like, "Well, just just tell him your problem." So she tells me, and I just start prophesying. But I'm telling her who she really is. I said, "That's not who. You, here's who you really are." And she starts losing it in a coffee shop. Just. You know, and it's like she was convicted because I was prophesying. I was telling her who she really was. The woman at the well knew who she really was. She wasn't supposed to be a, you know, immoral woman, uh, you know, a whore or whatever she was. Or She wasn't supposed to be that. She was supposed to do something else. And she left there. And the Bible says she went to another village and a whole bunch of people got saved. 
She literally went and did a revival. And she went and told everybody, you know, how do you get a woman to talk? Tell them not to. <laughs> Don't tell anyone. I'm just kidding. I'm not. I'm just kidding. Relax, ladies. Relax. Well, how do you get anybody to talk? Tell them it's a secret. Don't tell anybody. Okay. <laughs> so when you're prophesying, it says, verse 25. Hush now. Okay. <laughs> Move along. I'm sorry. I'm busted. Okay. Life calling. And thus the secrets of his heart are revealed, or her heart. And falling down on his face, he'll worship God and report that God's among you. When people tell you, tell you stuff that only you know, God knows, and there's no condemnation, they freak. They don't know what to do. All they know what to do, and they go, who is this, Matt? Who is this person that did this? Like, oh, he's awesome. God's awesome. Pray for me. So this girl, like, pray for me. It's like falling off a log. It's like, well, evangelism's a hard job. Not with the supernatural power of God working. You do All you do is say what you see and tell them and do it in the right spirit, in love. And people want to get saved. They're like, how must I be saved? I, I've done that. They say, how do I get saved? What does that mean? I go, well, uh, let's pray. <laughs> you know, it, it's really like falling off a log. So the secrets of his heart are not bad secrets. Like piled up with all this secret sin. There is no secret sin. God knows everything. But you know what? When God runs into people, he doesn't tell them all their junk. They already know it. He knows it. He tells them how to get out of it. That's what he did to the woman at the well. That's the way God operates. And my understanding, after looking at the prophetic, walking in it for, I don't know, 25, 30 years now, God, the purpose of this is not to expose sin. It's to expose their heart. And their heart is their destiny and their calling, which they know they've will be held accountable for before God someday. Like, I, we exist to do something on the earth, right? Every one of us. This awakens that. And that's why it's important for us to do this. When we prophesy, we awaken it in us too. Yeah. The great thing about operating and blessing other people is you, if you're a fire hose, if you're holding a fire hose, you're going to get really, really, really wet, and so the more you give out God, the more of God you get. Amen. And you're like, I just really feel dry. Go prophesy. Go start. Go out and preach. Woo. Well, I just feel, I've been really going through it. Good. Break out of that and just give us, give away. Oh, yeah. I, I think it's the greatest thing to break depression, lethargy. Yeah. Anyway, number three, what, third reason for the prophetic, equipping the body of Christ, building the body through the use of prophetic gifts. Now, how to hear. Let's move quickly. How to hear, and then we'll do some exercises. God is talking to everybody almost all the time. God speaks in unique ways. Moses was standing there, and he turned, and there was something going on. He was like, what is that? And he kind of looked, and he sees a bush burning, but it's not going anywhere. It's just sitting there. Like, it's burning, but it's not being consumed. That's weird. It looks like it's not even affecting it. And so he turned to look. It was weird. It was a sign. But he turns signs and miracles get people to turn to look. And when you turn to look, then God can speak. And when you turn to look, that's when God says, hey, Moses. And that's when all that happens. So Exodus 3.1, you can go back to that later. At the point our curiosity turns to the Lord, that's when the Lord speaks to us. This idea that God knows my address. Well, if I need healing, he knows my address. Ask, seek, knock. God doesn't operate that way. We don't, we need to go to him. He, you know, he will visit us, but he wants us to, he wants us to be, you know, interested. <laughs> he doesn't respond to passive inquirers, but passionate pursuers. Wow, where did that come from? That was good. <laughs> Write that down. <laughs> did I really just say that? That was good. He doesn't respond to passive inquirers. I'm just checking it out. We'll see. You know, uh, thank God we don't have a Facebook commitment with God. Like, will you or won't you? Mm, I don't know. Maybe. 
you know, that's what I hate about Facebook. Really? Maybe let your yes be yes and your no be no. God would rather you tell him, no, thanks. I'm not going to do it. Okay. Then to go, I don't know, maybe. How about the person, how about those two examples in the scripture where Jesus said, which one did the will of God? The one who said, I'll do it, and then they didn't go. Or the one that said, you can't make me do it. I'm never going to do that. And they think about it and go, yeah, okay, I'll do it. That's me. That's me. All the time I do that. I'm not going. <laughs> yeah, right. And I'll think about it, and the Lord will go, yeah, you ought to go. I was like, look at my wife. She goes, go. You know, uh, God, I don't want to go. So many, th I've had so many encounters with God where I said to myself, I don't want to do it. Seriously. So how does God speak? Feelings. Number one, impressions. I call this low level, just like you just walk by somebody and go, I wonder if she's depressed. You walk by somebody and you go, boy, somebody's angry around here. You pick up subtle little, now if somebody walks up to you and goes, I'm really mad. You'll go, hmm, I just discern you're angry. <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about how does God speak about other people? And here's the other thing. God is speaking to you about other people, not so you know they're junk or to hurt them. He's trying to get you to do something with it. So an impression. If you have an impression about somebody, ask the Lord immediately about it. Don't go ask them. Ask the Lord. And uh, impression level re revelations when recognized can be very dramatic. Just And sometimes you'll... You'll get much more information about other things, and then you'll jump into, you'll kind of move, lean into something like that, an impression, it it's really opens the door. A feeling. Sometimes during prophetic intercession, uh, sometimes God lets you feel in your body or emotions what other people are feeling. I just mentioned that. But that happens all the time. Then it also can become words of knowledge. You can literally walk in or be somewhere, and you feel great physically, and all of a sudden your knee hurts. You're like, my knee was fine. What, what did I do? Why is my left right here? And you might go, does anybody have a problem with your left knee? And three people go, me. That's called a word of knowledge. You feel what they need because you're to help them fix it. And you will, it will keep hurting. <laughs> you can go, oh, I don't know what's wrong. See, here's the thing. The Bible says we don't recognize the body. So many are sick, many lose sleep, and some die. Some are weak. Do you know what? If we recognize the things going on in our body about the body of Christ, we would bring healing to it. Does that make sense? Okay, we're going we're gonna to show you that in a minute. We might go more just than just prophetic. Hearing an inner voice, you just hear an inner voice that tells you something. Uh, some of us have heard an inner voice, get up, call so-and-so. And how many have done that? You just heard a voice to do something, and it meant something. Has that happened to you? Okay. How about an audible voice? Listen, if you hear an audible voice and don't respond, that you're really hard-hearted or something. I don't know. It's like, this is God. <laughs> what? I'm just really busy. <laughs> now, has anybody ever heard an audible voice? I've only heard it a few times. Scary, isn't it? And these people that act like they hear it every day, I feel sorry for them because if you've heard God's voice once in your life, audibly, you'll never forget it. Never, right? Uh, so that's the way God speaks. So here's the other thing. The more you get, the more you're responsible for. Like, I want to hear, I want to hear. Really? So, but all of this, we need to, we need to, we need to get more responsible. We've got to drop this false, it's not my problem, the pastor will deal with it. The leaders will deal with it. If the body was working, the whole thing would be like on autopilot. Seriously. It would fly, it worked like a Swiss watch. Just an amazing piece of the body working to, like right now your body right now if you're healthy your body is fighting off zeta zika or whatever it is ebola it's 
It could regularly, if the healthy immune system can fight off any kind of cancer, when you're healthy, your body is working, it fights stuff off. It doesn't even get a foothold. So, are y'all okay? Hearing discerning of spirits. Discerning of spirits is an entire gift, which basically is this demonic, is this angelic from, from the Holy Spirit, or is it some other thing? Uh, is it a color? Is it, you know, angels don't always show up like a guy with a big, a bunch of wings. Sometimes they're like bubbles. Sometimes they're like, you know, I, sometimes they're like, I believe a lot of these stories in history about these little fairies and things like that. A lot of this stuff, these aren't aliens, y'all. You know, it's, well, it was just a myth. Really? I mean, God can, I, I'm not sure what all that means, but I do know this. God will take whatever form he needs to take to get the job done. And he's used a lot of weird things, you know. Um, ha have you ever been rescued by a stranger and you looked at him and you were like, who is this person? And they bailed you out of something and then I, and you're going to thank them and they disappear. Has that ever happened to you? Has that ever happened to you? And they take human form. Uh, it's either the Lord or an angel. But the point is, these people speak to us and the, from, from the Lord. We're asking the Lord, Lord, help me. He will use angels. He will use the Holy Spirit. He'll use your gifts. And you never know how it's going to happen. So be open. Listen. Uh, discerning of spirits, sight, inner vision. You'll get a picture. Um, like... Uh, You'll just be looking at somebody, and you'll see a color um, you know, that means fire, could mean passion, could mean you could be looking at somebody and see green, uh, which is money, or it could mean a bunch of good things, fruitfulness. Um, and we got to learn to pay attention to the colors, pay attention to what we're feeling. Sometimes I'll just look. I'll be in a crowd. I'll look over, and I'll just one person will shine. It's like the room is dark. Somebody put a flashlight on them. But the lights are on, and I'll know. i got to work for that guy. I'll just And you're like, well, how do you know? It's hard to miss because it's like the whole thing got to zoomed in on this person, you know, and you got to pay attention to that because most of this isn't for a guy with a mic in front of a crowd. You know, this isn't parlor tricks. We're not the amazing Kreskin or whatever. It's not Vegas, right? This is to help in daily life. So open, sometimes we've had open visions where you're just in the day. Uh, Paul had them, you know, Peter had that one on the roof. Uh, has anybody ever had an open vision? Not many people have them. Uh, a lot of people don't. Have you had one? Freaked you out, didn't it? <laughs> yeah. All of these things will blow your mind. I mean, they're like, that was so weird. Yeah. But they mean something where to pay attention. Uh, discerning of spirits, sight, touch, smell, smell, you might walk up to somebody and just smell and go, I, you know, death has a smell. I've looked at people and, uh, said, come here, I want to pray for you and I break the spirit of death. And this thing lifts, a smell lifts or, uh, and it I don't, when I say death has a smell, yes, like corpses, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a spirit. There is a spirit of death. Spirits have, uh, you can see them, you can smell them, and you get to learn what they are. And, and many times we have words like, well, I just feel like the Lord wants to get this, this bondage off of you, you know, sometimes. Depression, heaviness. So we have to pay attention to all these things. Is everybody okay? Some of you have had dreams. Some of you have a subjective things that mean things to you. Like when you look at somebody, um, they remind you of somebody. Here's a good way to prophecy, prophesy. You go up to somebody and you look at them and you go, wow, she reminds me of Angela back home. So we're in Indiana. This is Ryan's story. But Ryan looks at this chick. Her name's Angela Sanchez. We didn't know that. He doesn't know her name. And he looks at her. He goes, and she reminded him of Angela back home. He's in Indiana. So he goes over to her, and he tells her everything that he knows Angela back home is. Well, I just see this, 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 this. And the girl's just, 
how did you know? And he goes, well, there's this girl named Angela. She goes, that's my name. Weird. But what it is is we have certain tribal aspects. Like if you go to different cultures, you go, well, they're South African. You go here and they go, well, they're this. They're German, right? You see cultural things that they all fit into a, this, there are people that are like that. Uh, I was praying last Thursday at a, this school ministry school I've been in that's ending in a few days. But I was there, and I looked at this girl, and I go, that's so weird. She, re she reminded me of somebody I don't know, but I know about her. It was a, it was a news uh, anchor, uh, and she had a certain name, and she used to be a press secretary for, the I think, President Bush or something, one of the Bushes, but she was a press secretary or something, and then now she's a mom and, you know, whatever, but I, you see her in the news, you know, you see her, she's in the news, and I look at that chick, and I was like, who does that, she remind me of, blah, 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 blah. and I go, that, it's her, and so I think, what is she like, so I go over to her, and I say, I looked at you, and you shocked me, because you reminded me of this person, and she didn't know as I, I was talking about. I think her name is Dana Perino or something like that. And I look at her and I said, boom, 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 boom. Because I know something, because I've watched this girl enough over the 10, 10 years at different points and different networks. And I, and I look at her and this girl starts losing it. Because I'm basically defining, I'm telling her who Dana Perino is, but it's really her. And so she is freaked out. I said, you're not letting your voice come out. You need to, eh. you know, boom, boom, boom. And it totally freaked her out. She's crying. Her heart was opened because she was denying who she really was. She's not going to be a press secretary, but she is supposed to lead people and tell them what's happening. So how do you, that, that was a way of interpreting what I saw. What I saw was a caricature of another person. So I just spoke as if they were that person. Does that make sense? So that was revelation, and the interpretation was she's reminding me of that because I think I'm supposed to talk to her about it. And then the application was I just went for it. And hey, it worked. So points on interpretation, and we're going to start doing a drill or a little, we're going to play some games. Interpretation is not a science. Science is learned by knowledge. Uh, but interpretation is an art. It's more a skill that takes uh, experience and observation. A little more like playing an instrument than learning uh, math equations. Does that make sense? So interpretation takes time. Uh, learning all of this takes time, but some of us will be so good at it, you'll be shocked. Uh, and I can tell right now, I can look at certain people and go, they're going to be awesome at it. And others might be more awesome than they are. You know, just because you start something doesn't mean you'll finish it. A lot of people are so gifted, they start it and do it well. They go, I got that. And so they let it go. And the Bible says the people that get the more talents, if they don't use them, even the talents they have, they will lose them. So use it or lose it. Right? So we're, any gift he gives us, we're supposed to use it. Don't get mad at me. <laughs> I'm just telling you what the Bible says. There's, let's talk about symbolism. You look at somebody, numbers mean things. Eight's the number of what? What does the number eight mean? New beginnings, new birth. What does seven mean? Right, what does three mean? The Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Three times three is nine. There's nine gifts, nine gifts of the Spirit, nine fruits of the Spirit, Galatians 5. Is everybody okay? Number four, and again, this is all biblical symbolism. There's four angels. There's four winds. There's four corners of the earth. There's four directions, north. Do you all know this? We go to school, but we don't know any of this. Uh, you got a GPS? North, south, east. Okay. Woo. I'm homeschooled. I don't know any of that. No. Uh, I only owe 50000 on my student loans, and I can't add. No, I'm just kidding. 
Hey, I'm kidding. <laughs> so there's scriptural symbolism, numeric symbols like in the Bible. There's cultural symbolism. If you're looking at somebody and you see a kangaroo, what does a kangaroo remind you of? All oh, Roy, it's Australia, mate. If you look at somebody and see a leprechaun, <laughs> you'll say you're demonized. No, <laughs> no. If you see like a sh if you see a shamrock or a clover, Ireland. If you see if you look at somebody and you see a bobby, like uh, one of those weird guys that guard the Queen's castle. Jolly old England, or you see Big Ben. In your, when you're praying for somebody, you see Big Ben. You might, sometimes God uses symbols, and he also, he also mixes things up. You could see a Big Ben and think, well, they must be called to go to UK, right? London. What if, what if their brother is a big guy named Ben? See, and sometimes God will use that. Are y'all getting this? So sometimes they'll mess you up. It's called a play on words, right? <laughs> like, like there are words that mean two things. We write, W-R-I-T-E, right? We write. He's writing, okay? Or are you right or wrong? And sometimes he'll, he'll use those plays on words. He'll, like the word read. R-E-A-D. You have read something. You might see the color red, but it doesn't mean the color. It could mean they, they have, you know, they've been read this or something. And you're like, well, that's really cool. It is cool because God will never be figured out. You're not going to figure this out. The minute you get it figured out, you're going to, he's going to throw you a curve. You go, wow, I didn't know you'd do that. So there's no system. I can't give you a system for it. You gotta trust the Holy Spirit for you because you're wired differently than anybody around you. Uh, there's cultural symbolism, natural symbolism. Ear is a symbol of hearing, prophetic, hearing from God. Your heart, you know, guard your heart with. Uh, you could see a bobby. You could see a guard. It could be God telling them to guard their heart. Uh, you know, it may not be that at all. Uh, personal symbolism, personal experience that only those people understand. Or only you understand, like me seeing the Dana Perino chick and talking to a total stranger I just met and telling her, I was describing what Dana, what I know of Dana Perino, and she's weeping. Word symbolism. God speaks to Jeremiah using the symbolism of words. Uh, house, literal or familial. Houses mean you're a natural house or a family. The house of Saul. So there's no system. So the warning is don't, here's things that'll mess you up on this, uh, trying to do it, uh, to try to misinterpret it, because uh, you have to rely on the Holy Spirit. Things that will mess it up, prejudices of uh, races, women, men. Like if I've known uh, over the years, I've met many women abused by men, even maybe their father or their uncle. So they have a man-hating spirit. I've met women who have a, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, yeah, a woman that was abused by a man, so she had a man-hating spirit. I've seen men abused by their mothers that are misogynist. They hate women. They have a wrong view of women. Uh, and some people are just jerks about all of it. That's not what I'm talking about, but I'm talking about a prejudice because of a wound. Most prejudice are because of a wound, you know, a bad uh, personal opinion is based on our own failed, bad, or good experiences. Or a religious spirit. Uh, bad theology. If we think God is excessively good, he is good. But if we don't see that he's also just, and the rules aren't special, just God didn't do all of this just for you. Yes, you're special, just like everybody else. You know what I'm saying? There's, <laughs> we are special. We're his workmanship, but he's no respecter of persons. That's the hard thing about God. If he's going to have justice, he can't deny it for them to give it to you. 
And that's what a lot of our society thinks, well, to right or wrong, let's just mess up everybody else to get what I want. It's like, no, that's unjust or unjust. God is not unjust. So that's bad theology, pride and traditions of men. So uh, when we administer prophecy, know your level of authority, know your level of understanding, your level of faith, be confident, trust God, good luck. Ask, how do you do it? Ask God to speak. Listen to what he says. Tell them. Um, <laughs> revelation is that which is not and comes to pass many times. Clairvoyance? <laughs> it, don't, yeah. Uh, we're not here to be clairvoyant. Just tell them weird stuff. I just see. Hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, Satan never lost his power, but he lost his authority. So we don't need to worry about it. By the way, if we ask God to help us, the devil's not going to get slip you something. The way we make mistakes is through human pride, human uh, need for approval, things like that. So so we're going to, we got about 30 minutes here to do this. So that's about what I wanted. So I'm done with teaching. Is everybody okay? Is everybody perfected in the prophetic? <laughs> Here's how we're going to do it. You ready? I want everybody to, um, well, this is weird. We got gals on one side and guys on the other. That's interesting. Um, <laughs> it wasn't on purpose. Okay. <clears throat> this is going to mess you up, but I'm just going to, is that okay that I make you a little uncomfortable? I'm going to need you to... Do this with somebody you don't know all their junk. So it's like, well, he's my best friend. Let me prophesy for him. No, because you already know you have to empty yourself of everything you know about him to tell him anything. But if you go to a total stranger, you know nothing. You're like, God, help me. This is going to be a disaster. And you know what? If you ask God to show you for something, if you ask for a fish, are you going to get a scorpion? And so everybody needs to relax. Everybody take a deep breath. <gasps> okay. Now stand up. It's going to be fun. <laughs> okay.